Hi, I'm Roseanne and welcome to my winter garden. As with most gardeners, I spend considerably less time in the garden in the winter. That's why it's a perfect time of year to reflect on your own garden and things you might want to change or improve over the coming summer. In this video, I'll show you from beginning to end how we transformed a narrow patch of land into a lush side yard garden. This garden is now home to a variety of trees, shrubs, and perennials, chosen for their shape, texture, and color. And along the meandering stone path, there's a bit of whimsy to make people smile. For perspective, this is a bird's eye view diagram of our property, landscaped as it is today. The tan shapes are stone hardscape, colored shapes represent trees or shrubs, the solid green is grass, and the white space is either perennials, annuals, or mulch. The project I'll cover in this video is the narrow garden to the south of our house. It's actually a follow-on to a project we completed a year earlier, our backyard makeover. If you're interested, check out my video on it. Whenever we get started on a large garden design project, we follow the same fundamental steps which I'll cover in this video. First of all, it's always important to find your inspiration. As an ongoing process, I find visiting other gardens, garden centers, and garden shows to be very inspiring for both design ideas and new plant ideas. I enjoy seeing new varieties of plants and especially beautiful plant combinations. It's a good way to get ideas and figure out what you like in a garden. Something that really inspired me was this postcard my husband sent to me from England. From this point on, I fell in love with the look of climbing plants on structures. Choosing your theme or aesthetic is really about how you want your garden to look and feel. Early on, before our first landscape project, I knew I wanted a garden that complemented our house and vice versa. In a word, I wanted a garden that felt like it was enchanted. For us, that included lots of weeping trees and unusual shrubs, whimsical touches, moss-lined stone paths, and a garden shed that looks like it's straight out of a fairy tale. Sticking to our theme has guided us through many decisions and kept our garden feeling unified, even though it was designed and installed over the course of many years. Other themes might be romantic or formal, such as this garden, with straight symmetrical hedges and a stunning sculptural focal point surrounded by verbena and breezy grasses. Another popular theme is cottage. This cottage garden is home to lots of climbing roses and tightly planted multicolored pastel perennials. Casual displays add to the informal and welcoming feel to the garden. Other themes might be centered around wildlife, such as creating a pollinator garden, beneficial to bees, butterflies, and other insects. Once you know the look and feel you're after, it's time to create a wish list. My number one wish was to create a welcoming garden entrance and a path that would connect our front yard to our backyard. I wanted to decorate the walls of our house with climbing plants, especially roses. Trees are on all of my wish lists. In this case, they would need to be dwarf varieties or very narrow varieties. In addition to looking good, I love the wildlife they attract. Lastly, I wanted to incorporate some garden art or whimsy. Getting to know your space involves having good measurements of your property, understanding sun exposure, and knowing your soil conditions. When my husband and I first started doing garden landscape projects, we used a tape measure and graph paper. As our garden evolved, so did our drawings. The scope of this project involved a long, narrow patch that measured 7 feet wide and 50 feet long. 
and then widened for approximately another 12 feet and included the area bordering our patio, which we installed just a year earlier. The area faces south and is in full sun, making for a very warm garden. It wasn't always like that. The genesis for our backyard makeover project, of which this project is an extension, was the loss of a majestic elm tree. We went from shade to sun in a day. As for the soil, it was nice to work with. It had medium coarse texture and was ever so slightly alkaline with a pH of 7.1. A pH in the 6 to 7 range is considered ideal for most plants. The area would eventually be irrigated with a drip zone, so moisture levels would also be average. Our hardiness zone was 4. It's a measure determined by the USDA which captures how cold your winters are and how hardy plants have to be to survive that cold. The lower the number, the colder the winters. At this point in the process, it's really tempting to go out and start buying plants. But before you get too eager, I highly recommend you get your plan on paper. I start with the structural elements, or those items that will be difficult to move in the future, such as hardscape or permanent wooden structures. I consider these the bones of the garden. I began with a blank canvas of the area. First on my list was to create a welcoming garden entrance by adding an arbor to the fence we had recently installed. After much online research, we decided on a four-posted wooden arbor with a curved arch top and lattice sides, which matched the fence and our theme. Next was to select a vining plant to grow on it. My first choice for the arbor was wisteria, but I always considered it a warmer climate plant. Much to my surprise, I found a variety that was hardy in Zone 4. Blue Moon Wisteria is a hardy cultivar of Kentucky Wisteria, a plant native to the U.S. Wisteria likes full sun, so this location seemed ideal as it would get lots of sun, both from the south and the west. It can be aggressive, so regular pruning would be necessary. Other than the pruning, I found the wisteria to be very low maintenance. I've now had it for over 15 years, and it blooms faithfully every spring. In that time, the stems have gotten quite thick. If planting wisteria, it's important to have a strong structure to support it. With the arbor decided, it was time to decide on the path which would connect the front garden to the back garden. Because we use Sandy Creek sandstone throughout our garden already, it was a natural decision to continue using it in this project as well. Repeating the use of the same materials helps to make the garden feel cohesive or unified. Rather than a solid path, such as this narrow one around our garden shed, we decided to use flagstone stepping stones placed about four to eight inches apart. We thought it would fit better with the casual, natural look we were after, especially when combined with large patches of Sagina subulata, more commonly known as Irish moss. I believe ground covers are an important layer in the garden, and Irish moss certainly contributes to the enchanted feel we were after. Despite its common name, it's a perennial in the carnation family, and not related to real moss at all. It does best for me in lightly dappled shade with consistent moisture. From my point of view, the biggest design challenge was to make the area look less long and narrow. Rather than a straight path with two narrow beds on each side, we opted for a curved, meandering path. This design created some larger growing areas, good for small trees, and some narrower areas, which worked well with smaller or vertically grown plants. My husband, who's done all of our stonework, prefers thick, solid flagstones that he can wedge into the ground so that every stone is stable and the surface of every stone is level. A couple of years after he completed the pathway, he surprised me with a plan to build a turtle stepping stone into the path. 
He used cardboard cutouts to determine the right size to make the turtle and a stone saw to cut the shapes. The turtle, which symbolizes longevity, faces due west, which in some Japanese lore is said to be the beginning of life. Usually adorned with Irish moss and surrounded by colorful flowers, this bit of garden art never fails to surprise and delight garden guests. With the stone path pretty much decided, I moved on to other relatively permanent structural elements, such as a large wooden trellis attached to the house and centered between two windows. I knew I wanted climbing roses on it and decided on the William Baffin variety. It's part of the Canadian Developed Explorer series and is hardy to Zone 3. It blooms profusely in late June and occasionally after that. In this location, it would get full sun, a requirement of most roses. It looks absolutely stunning when the wisteria flowers at the same time. As a bonus, the semi-double blooms are also fragrant. Next, I wanted to green up the rest of the southern-facing wall. I've long been an admirer of espalier, or trees that have been trained to a decorative two-dimensional form. The practice got its formal start in the 16th century, where fruit trees were trained on walls to take advantage of extra warmth and protection. The walls of our house would seem to be a perfect place to grow decorative apple trees. We consulted a fellow gardener with expertise in espalier, who helped us immensely the first few years. To provide the structure for the trees, we installed two poles with five rows of heavy stainless cable between them. The apple trees are William's Pride, which are said to be more disease resistant than other varieties. We have three braided pairs of espalier for six trees total. The trees looked gangly in the beginning, but over the years grew to span an area 18 feet wide. With the design of the major structural elements completed, it was time to focus on selecting the other plants. To achieve a lush, full look, I would layer the garden with plants of varying heights, shapes, colors, and textures. I would also need to balance the structure on the north side of the path with equal mass and presence on the south side. I began by researching available narrow or dwarf tree varieties and decided on two lovely flowering crab apple trees. The first, situated close to the gate, was Lancelot. It's an adorable little lollipop shaped tree that has red flower buds that open to white flowers, followed by little fruit. The other crab apple was Red Baron. It's the deep red flowering tree in the background. This one grows tall, but remains relatively narrow. Now that it's over 15 years old, we do need to prune it to keep it from getting wider. Initially, I did not include evergreen trees, and the garden didn't seem balanced. We later planted a yellow ribbon arborvitae. It has unusual coloring with chartreuse tip needles. We also planted three de Groot Spire arborvitae, known for their tall and very narrow growth habit. These are close to 15 years old and are still only a little more than two feet wide. The impact the arborvitae have on this narrow garden is significant. Because the only vantage point is to look down the path, the trees create an illusion of a green wall. You get the feeling of being encompassed in a lush garden as you make your way down the path. Making our way to the back garden, we added an Acrocana spruce, which we have repeated elsewhere in the garden, and a white spire birch tree. The Acrocana spruce has a loose, untidy growth habit and the most unusual and enticing red cones in the spring. It's a cultivar of Norway spruce, which makes it hardy in this area. The birch has the most stunning bright white bark that doesn't peel. It's very happy in this area as it likes cool, moist soil for its shallow roots. The white spire's canopy is light and airy and produces lovely dappled shade. 
Across the path, it was time to think about landscaping next to the patio. Rather than having the patio open to the path, I wanted to create a sense of privacy by at least partially blocking the view from one to the other. We decided on a narrow spruce and a weeping mulberry. The spruce died after a few years, and we replaced it with our tried-and-true De Groot Spire Arborvitae. The weeping mulberry is definitely one of my favorites in our entire garden. It's now over 15 years old and keeps getting more interesting. The lopsided weeping form is certainly enchanting throughout the seasons. With the structures and trees in place, the next layers to consider were shrubs, perennials, and annuals. I'll share with you the most significant or defining plants which are currently in our side yard garden because over the years the garden has evolved. Let's begin with the attention grabbing calla lilies which can be seen immediately after one enters the gate. I love the elegant white blooms of these tropical plants and grow them throughout our garden. They bloom from mid-June to mid-July. Because they're only hardy to zones 8 or 9, I dig up their bulbs, or rhizomes, every fall and replant them every spring. They get some dappled shade from the pickets of the fence and appreciate the consistently moist soil. Across from the callas is a striking single petal white peony. It dies completely down to the ground every winter and is one of the first plants to emerge in the spring, helped by the warmth of the house and the warm southern exposure. This variety is named crinkled white. One look at the petals and it's easy to see why. Crepe paper blooms surround a tufted golden center. It blooms in early summer before the calla lilies start blooming. Some lucky years were fortunate to have the peony, wisteria, and climbing rose bloom all at once. A second peony on the other side of the trellis reliably provides masses of bright pink colored blooms at approximately the same time as the crinkled white. Its blooms also have lovely golden centers. What makes this one special is that it was a volunteer. Way back, a seed must have come from a neighbor's plant and germinated. I consider it a gift of nature. Next to the crinkled white peony is a turtle head plant. Beginning in August, it produces tall racemes of pink flowers, which begin flowering at the bottom and make their way up a central stem. The botanical name is Chelone, derived from the Greek word for tortoise. Looking closely, it's easy to see the resemblance of the blooms to a turtle's head. Because it's native, the bees love it, and it does well in almost any conditions, I have it planted throughout our garden. For many of the same reasons, I'm a huge fan of hosta. On the other side of the path is a large-leafed, summon-substance hosta. I love the way its big leaves and their chartreuse color contrast with the dark green of the arborvitae behind it. At the point of the path where there is a wider area and a narrower area, we chose to plant a shrub rose and another turtle head in the wide area and three rock and roll stilby in the narrow area. The shrub rose is a rugosa rose, often called a wild rose. The flowers are a lovely shade of pink and quite fragrant. It's no surprise that this is a favorite of bees. Known to be incredibly hardy, they can also be invasive in some regions of the U.S. The astilbe, which is protected from direct sun, has lovely white feathery blooms. The blooms don't last long, but when they're done, I get to enjoy the delicate foliage for the rest of the summer. Next to the astilbe is a daylily. Even when it's not flowering, I enjoy its grass-like leaves. This variety, Mary Todd, produces lots of thick golden flowers. I repeat this plant further down the path and at least half a dozen other places throughout our garden. Hydrangea are such wonderful shrubs, and this twist and shout variety is among my favorites. Its showy lace cap flowers are truly striking. I do fertilize this plant with an organic balanced fertilizer to keep the plant healthy and blooming. 
Some years I add sulfur or acid to the soil to get more of a blue or purple bloom. Another hydrangea further down the path is our endless summer. Surrounded by golden colored daylilies, the blue blooms of the endless summer are particularly attractive. It's a beautiful plant and I love the blue color, but it hasn't always flowered for me. However, as with the twist and shout variety, I find applying a couple doses of fertilizer does the trick. Making our way down the path, which is becoming shadier, there are a few more plants I'd like to point out. The first is bugbane. It's an attractive, unusual looking native plant that's very low maintenance and enjoys partial shade. The tall stems are a lovely chocolate color. Surrounding the bugbane, and in a few more places further down the path, I have Rhineland astilbe. Its feathery plumes have a delightful rose pink color that brightens up the path. On the other side of the red barren crabapple tree, there's a large, beautifully colored guacamole hosta. I have it growing elsewhere in this side yard garden, all propagated from dividing one single plant. There are many ferns in our garden, most of them ostrich, which are both graceful and incredibly easy to grow. However, I find this smaller, Japanese painted fern to be quite enticing. Unfortunately, for me, it seems to be fussy to grow. I've needed to replace the plants over the years. Next to the birch tree, in its shade, I have Golden Glow Rudbeckia. Because normally Rudbeckia likes full sun, I wouldn't have thought to plant it here. The bright yellow flowers and the white birch bark make for quite a lovely combination, and one brought to you entirely by Mother Nature. These are volunteers, which I just left alone. As I mentioned earlier, I use a lot of hosta throughout our garden. I use it as focal points, filler, and to calm down all the other colors and textures. In addition to the variegated varieties, I like to use this deep green, shiny-leaved lancifolia, where I'm after a more refined and controlled look. Finally, as we wind down this garden design project, I'd like to point out the importance of colorful bedding plants in this design. Usually, I plant them along the path in groups of three or five to look random and natural. I especially like to plant them next to my bunny statues for a colorful bit of whimsy. I believe we've reached the end of the path and this garden design project, at least for the time being. The garden will continue to evolve, and we as gardeners will continue to adapt. Therein lies the challenge and the joy. I hope you enjoyed the stroll down the narrow side yard garden path and took away some ideas that you might try in your own garden. Thanks for watching.